Thank you everyone for joining us today and welcome to GoWin's webinar series. Today's discussion is Design Start FPGA 101, how to design with ARM Cortex M1. My name is Scott Casper with GoWin Semiconductor and I'll be your moderator. Our speaker today is David Grugit with GoWin Semiconductor. Please feel free to send us questions via the question or chat button throughout the presentation. We will answer them at the end. Our agenda for today will be as follows. Speaker biography, introduction to GoWin Semiconductor, Design Start FPGA, designing an ARM Cortex M1 soft CPU IP into GoWin FPGAs, and we'll, we will finish it with questions and answers. Now a bit about our speaker. David Grugit is a senior FAA manager, Americas for GoWin Semiconductor, focused on implementation of solutions for programmable technologies. He has over a decade of FPGA systems architecture and implementation experience in areas including ASIC prototyping, interfacing, bridging, and edge connectivity. Mr. Grugit received his Bachelor of Science in Electronics Engineering Technology from DeVry University. Now a brief overview of Goen Semiconductor. Goen was founded in 2014. Our executive headquarters is located in San Jose, California, and our operational headquarters is located in Guangzhou, China. We have over 160 people employed in R&D, engineering, and administration. We serve the low to mid range density markets for FPGA needs from 1K LUTs to 100K LUTs. We offer two product families, our Little B Flash-based FPGAs and our Aurora SRAM-based FPGAs. Little B's low density products are targeted for mobile, consumer, and IoT applications such as bridging and multiplexing. They are also used in industrial, commercial, and server applications for CPLD replacement and power or platform management. The Aurora mid-density products are targeted for communication, industrial, and automotive applications with high-speed interfacing and I.O. expansion needs. Goen is known as the innovative FPGA company. Some of the key differentiating features are hardened embedded MCUs, embedded PSRAM or DRAM memory up to 16 megabytes, a vast offering of I.O. interfaces, low power operation as low as 10 microwatts in sleep mode, and embedded security offering root of trust capability, authentication, encryption and decryption, and secure cloud connectivity. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to David for a main presentation. Thank you, Scott. Welcome to GoWin's ARM Design Start FPGA webinar. Design Start is a no cost, no license, royalty free Cortex M1 IP program. The Cortex M1 is optimized for FPGAs to use smaller area and more control logic. GoWin and ARM want to help you differentiate your product, reduce your costs, and shorten your development time. And that's why the Design Start FPGA program offers a fast, easy, and instant way to simply integrate a complete Cortex M1 onto a GoIn Micro SOC FPGA. The flow for today is in two segments the FPGA design flow and the software design flow. The FPGA design flow uses RTL languages such as Verilog, VHDL, and System Verilog to user for the user design and then the Cortex M1 IP itself is going to be in Verilog so we can handle mixed language designs. Same thing with our synthesis tool we use Simplify Pro from Synopsys and we have our own place and route tool in the EDA FPGA designer to create a bitstream. Now on the software design flow we're going to use C code for the user design along with the GoIn C library. The Kyle MDK tool or the uh, GNU MCU uh, Eclipse based development tool have compilers and linkers to take the C code and create an image file. And with image file and bitstream file combined, we have a GoIn 
micro SOC FPGA that can be targeted to one of our development boards or your end customer product. The reference designs, and there are several, and there are targeting many different FPGAs from going as well as uh, debug and non-debug modes, can be downloaded off our website. The main zip file is going EMPU M1.zip, and that's the embedded processor uh, unit for the M1 family. And that it will include that zip file when you unzip it. I usually do it on the C drive, and then the, the um, subfolders will um, point to the reference designs and the documentation. Documentation is for uh, the FPGA flow as well as the software flow. The development tools are free. You can get them off our website in the download EDA section. We have both Windows and Linux support. Uh, we have Windows 7, 8, and 10 in the 64-bit, Windows 7 in XP in 32-bit. And for Linux, we have the uh, CentOS 6, Red Hat 6, and 7, SUSE 11 and 12, 64-bit support. And for licensing, we have the ability to node lock to a single computer, or we can have floating licenses uh, for sharing on a licensed server. The Go and EDA FPGA designer tool includes IP core generator. IP core generator supports all of our hard and soft IPs, which are free, and the soft IP for the Cortex M1 is included. And the hardened M3 IP core that's on our GW1NS device is also included in IP core generator. The software tools can be downloaded from the Kyle MDK development tool library uh, that's available for a free trial. The GNU ARM embedded tool chain, which is Eclipse based, is a pre built GNU tool chain. And that also can be downloaded off the developerarm.com website. These tools uh, are available with Microvision IDE uh, on the MDK, and that is also including a debugger and an uh, ARM C and C compiler and linker. And the other features for the MDK tool, the micro development kit, is the event recorder, a component viewer and the ability to show runtime behavior of your software components. And together with a microlink debugger and trace adapter, you can have full instruction trace functionality and complete code coverage information using the IDK, IDE tool, MDK. So the first area that we'll talk about is the Kyle flow, or the software flow, using the IDE tool. The software design flow uses the Go and C library, which is included in the install. The C code will be linked and compiled with the Kyle MDK tool, creating image files that can be used in your micro SOC FPGA. When you unzip the GoIn embedded processor unit M1 zip file, you'll get a lot of subfolders, and that's where we can find our projects. In this case, the reference design that we're going to use is the MCU reference design. And in the subcategory of the MCU reference design, we have two folders, one for the GNU MCU tool and one for the Kyle reference design. And then once we are in there, we can see several projects. The project we're going to talk about today is the LED project. And you can see with the Micro Vision 5 project LED uh, icon that we can double click on it and it'll launch the Micro Vision 5 project. The first thing we want to do is configure for the Cortex M1 device. This Kyle tool will support all the Cortex M devices including the M3, which is available on our GW1S device, the hardened uh, IP core. But in this case, with the Design Start FPGA program, we're going to focus on the M1. So the ARM CM1 is the Cortex M1 processor that we're going to configure. 
and we're going to use the software pack with the CMSIS, some call it SimSys, some call it CAMSYS. Uh, the CMCSIS is the Cortex Microcontroller Software Interface Standard, and it enables consistent and simple software interfaces to the processor for all the peripherals, real-time operating systems, and middleware. It'll simplify your software reuse and reduce your learning curve, as well as cut time to market for your design. The next configuration will be the memory. We're going to use the on-chip memory for ROM and for, for the instruction and for RAM for the user memory. Uh, you can see we're going to start at address 0 for the ROM, the instructions, and then the user memory is at 2000. The size is uh, scalable depending on how much memory is on the FPGA. In this case, we're going to use 32K bytes for both the instruction and the user memory. Uh, you can use off-chip memory, too, for your design, if you so desire. We're also going to set the frequency to 12 megahertz, and so that'll be uh, coming from our PLL that's on the FPGA device from an external oscillator on the board. So to get the uh, output files that we need for our design, we're going to run a couple of scripts. These are after-build scripts that are going to convert the AXF file, which is what the Kyle tool exports. Uh, it'll be the name of the project, led.axf. And this script will convert it to a binary file. But that binary file needs to be segmented into the embedded block RAM segments that we have on the FPGA. So we're going to have multiple ITCM files, and that will be based on 18K bits per embedded block memory. So we're going to have about four of these ITCM files, which is instruction tightly coupled memory files. So the two steps will be done after we do the uh, compiling. For our source code, we're going to have a, a bunch of header files, and we need to include those paths for the the core itself, the peripherals, uh, the startup system, and the user. So we just make sure that those are in the include paths for our main file. And then debug. We have a couple of uh, debug options with Kyle tool and the U-Link connector and, and trace cable. We have JTAG, which is going to a 20-pin header. And then if we select it, then we have the TDO, TDI signals and interrupt requests for that, that port. It'll be separate from the JTAG port on the FPGA. This will be dedicated to the Cortex processor. And then we have the serial wire debugging interface. It uses less pins, and some people leave that on their design for production, so they have the ability to go in and and uh, access debugging capabilities in the final product using less uh, pins on their device. But that is also available for debugging with the U-Link cable. So with the header settings, we can see our startup system, peripheral, and user uh, headers made it in there in all of our peripheral code for the GPIO, the timers, the UARTs and the watchdog timers. And then we have our main code. And then once we uh, compile, we can see that uh, they're compiled, all the C code. And then the, the two scripts are run. The first one to convert the AXF output file to binary. And then we partition that big binary file to the multiple hex files that are for the ITCM. So we'll get those files for our FPGA flow. So the, the tools for FPGA flow are going EDA FPGA tools are free, uh, available for Windows and Linux. And the flow will be to use the user design using Verilog, VHDL, System Verilog, uh, accompanied with the Cortex M1 IP, which we generate to our IP core generator and it exports Verilog. So once you've created the IP platform, 
then you can synthesize it with your user design, take that and place and route it towards a targeted device. And then that output will be a bit stream. It's a .fs file. So this .fs file will have the .hex files combined together so that we can target a Go and micro SOC FPGA. So much like the software flow, the hardware flow is still in the reference design folders, only this time we'll target the FPGA reference design subdirectory and we'll choose the debug reference design. You have the non-debug if you're ready to go into production and you don't want these debug ports, whether it's the serial wire or JTAG. But then we also have options for our dev kits. So we have the DK start GW2A18 that we'll use today. And what it is is the Goin uh, 2 family. It's the Aurora family, and it's got 18,000 lookup tables on it. And then the project name will, will be consistent. It'll be Goin Embedded Processor Unit M1. And so you'll see in that folder the Goin logo, and that's for the Goin project file. And if you double click on that Goin EMPU M1 file, you'll launch the Goin FPGA Designer project. And then the project is where we can use our Goin IP core generator. And this is included in all our installs. So all the IPs are installed with every tool installation. You don't have to download, download them separately. If you go to the tools pull down menu and launch the IP core generator, you'll start seeing all of our IPs that are available. Some will be in, in dark, bold colors, some will be grayed out. The reason being is that the target device will let you know if you're able to use or not use the IP, whether it's a hard module or a soft IP in that device. Now the Goin EMPU M1 is about a 5,000 lookup table minimum. So if you detect or select a GW2A device, which is 18 KLUTs or 55 KLUTs, it'll be available for the user to configure. If you selected a little b device that's about a 1K density, it'll be grayed out because it doesn't have enough lookup tables for that Cortex-M1. But you'll also notice on the soft IP core we have in the microprocessor subsystem a hardcore MCU and that's the GW1NS, which has the Cortex M3. But right now we'll focus on the soft M1 that's available. And if we double click on that, then we'll be able to go in and configure the uh, M1 for our application. Configuring the Cortex M1, it starts with this nice block diagram of the Cortex M1 itself, showing all the inputs and outputs that are available, including interrupt requests up to 32, uh, the debug interfaces, which could be the serial wire or JTAG, the instruction tightly coupled memory for our ROM, and then our data tightly coupled memory, which is in RAM. We also have a high speed bus that can interface to a lot of peripherals, as well as the general purpose IO. Then we also have a peripheral bus that's available with more peripherals that we can use in our design. But let's start with just configuring the Cortex-M1 itself by enabling the interrupts. And we do that by looking at the uh, common tab. We get to it by double clicking on the Cortex-M1 block. And then the first thing we see is the common tab, which can have up to 32 interrupts selected, as we can see here. We're going to use eight interrupts on our design, and we can see the block diagram will um, change as we select and deselect these options. The other option, as you know, the uh, operating system, real-time operating systems are available for the Cortex-M1. If you have an OS extension for that operating system, then you might select it here. Uh, make sure that's not selected on this uh, reference design. The next tab is the debug tab. And we did select serial and JTAG on our uh, software flow. So we have that support. If you want just serial wire, you can select that or JTAG, you can select that. But the key thing is to enable debug and then pick one of the interfaces and the block diagram will 
um, show you what it's supporting. And you'll always get a nice description about what the block diagram has uh, within this little context window. So the next tab over after common and debug is memory. This is where we can enableize, initialize the instruction tightly coupled memory and point to where those hex files are. So we'll have the uh, path that we created our Kyle reference design in and uh, compiled it. So we'll double click on the dot, dot, dot to point to that path. We'll navigate to that Kyle reference design LED project folder. That's all we have to do is point to the folder and select that. And then we're able to use that as part of our instruction application for the Cortex-M1. The next step is to enable the general purpose I.O. And if we double click on that block, then we'll get the AHB, the high speed bus. And all we have to do is enable the GPIO and then click OK. And then we'll have access to the peripherals that we can add to the design. So you'll notice the GPIO turned green. That means we went in and configured it. So we now have the ability to add on to these peripherals on our uh, reference design. The first reference peripheral that we're going to use are the UARTs, and there's two of them available. So it really doesn't matter if you're going to enable one or both. Just click on either one of them, and it'll open the configuration block for that UART. Once again, you'll get a uh, little detail about the the baud rates, et cetera, about the UARTs. They're uh, both created equally. If you enable both of them, it'll show up in the block diagram as part of your peripheral bus. If you select just one, like if we deselected UART 1, this would disappear and we just have one UART. So the more peripherals you use, the bigger the uh, design will be. If you select both of them and then click OK, you'll be ready to continue with this uh, LED project reference design. Once again, UARTs went green because we're going to use them in our design. And we're ready to, to enable our timers and configure our timers. Uh, these are UART, or I'm sorry, timer zero and timer one. We double click on either one of them to open up this window. Uh, get some description. They're 24 bit counters. Uh, we can enable both of them. Timer zero and timer one are enabled. And then we click OK and move on to our last peripheral that we're going to use in this reference design. That would be the watchdog timer. So this peripheral, if we enable it, we can see the signals for uh, petting the watchdog timer. If we don't uh, um, pet it within the, the, the time window, then it'll bark. So that'll be part of our design. So now you can see all the things that we touched are green as far as the general purpose I.O the peripherals, and you can see the things that we didn't touch. So there's a lot of peripherals available that uh, can include real-time clocks, random number generators, dual timers, uh, serial interfaces. You can even extend these buses to include some of your homegrown uh, peripherals or uh, extend that bus to the, to the actual, actual pins on the FPGA to have external uh, peripherals brought into the device. So if they're OK as far as the settings, we're going to create it in the folder that we created the project in. And we click OK, and it'll add those Verilog files for all the, the Cortex-M1 core and the peripherals into our current project. So that's in the design flow. And we'll see that in the HDL files, we did get those Verilog files added to our design. This is the uh, top level of just the uh, EMPUM1 file and then all the um, sub files that are included with that. The PLL is what takes the oscillator on the board and converts it to uh, 12 megahertz. That's the, what we set up in uh, Kyle. The other thing that we do is is we offer a um, top level wrapper and that will connect the Cortex M1 with the PLL and anything else in your design if it uh, has more um, 
uh, application specific uh, information for your design. You can add that in Verilog or, or VHDL. So once we've got our source files, we can click on the process to process these source files. And we'll have to synthesize them. And we use that with the default synthesis tool, which is Simplify Pro. It's a real nice tool because uh, once you've synthesized and you've got your net list, you can go in and use the HDL Analyst, which is a nice tool that interprets what your uh, Verilog code or your source code uh, looks like as far as the schematic. So it can see you can see if it's interpreted correctly. So that's a nice uh, feature with the synthesize synthesis tool. Here's the uh, how you, where you can launch it on its own. But the net list that you get generated. Um, can be run through the floor planner, and that's where you can actually select which pins on the device you want to use. Or if you've got some highly constrained clocking, you could put timing constraints in the uh, constraint editor, and it's all based on the, the signal names in the synthesis netlist. So if you double click on synthesize, it'll generate that netlist for you, and, and then report. And then we'll go to the next step, which is placing and routing the design. So if you right click on the configuration or right click on the place and route, you can get a configuration uh, capability, which is if you click on that, um, three tabs. Uh, the first tab is general, and that's where we can turn on the standard delay format file. And that's good for timing simulation. The default for all these is false. So if you double click on the, the value, you can toggle it back to true. Uh, same thing for the place and route files and simulation files. Uh, if you click them true and apply them and hit OK, then you'll get a lot of these report files for your, your design. The next tab is the dual purpose pin capability. A lot of embedded designs like to put them into small packages and what we offer is the ability to dual use some pins and the pins that are only used on power up or configuration such as JTAG or slave spy, master spy, uh, some control signals like ready and done, reconfigure, those can be used as regular IO. Now in this reference design where we've got enough pins in the, the package we're using so we don't need to have dual purpose but it's nice to know that in your application you can uh, use that capability for some small packages in your embedded design. So make sure nothing's selected for this reference design. And then we move on to the last tab, which is the bitstream. And because we're just going to be prototyping, we don't need security bit enabled. The default is enable security bit. And what that means is once you've configured an FPGA, you can't read back what's inside of it. So if you can't read back, you can't debug. So We'll disable it for now, and then when you're ready to enable it for a production bitstream so no one can read your design, uh, you can turn that on. So with the configuration of place and route finished, we're ready to place and route the, the netlist file. And if we double click on place and route, we'll create that .fs bitstream. And with that bitstream, which includes the hex files uh, in memory for the instruction application for the Cortex-M1, we're ready to target a development board. And we have several available. Uh, in this webinar, we're talking about the DK Start GW2A18 board. It's got the 18K LUT device. It's the LV, which is low voltage, about one volt. And then it's got the BGA-256 package, and it's commercial temperature with a speed grade of 8. We dual mark our part, so a C8 commercial is uh, a industrial 7 grade. So the industrial temperatures slow down the device, so it's probably about a 10% lower uh, speed in industrial temperatures. The Trends Micro is available with the GWN R9. 9,000 lookup tables is more than enough for our smallest Cortex M1, which is about 5,000 lookup tables. So you could add even more peripherals or user design to this device. 
It's in a smaller package too, so you have less IOs. It's in a QFN88 package, uh, but it's a tiny um, uh, PCB and it's got some abilities to put headers to actually probe the pins or put a uh, debug header for the software debug. These boards are available through our distributors. Trends is our European distributor that uh, has these boards and then Edge Electronics in the US uh, has these uh, DK start boards which are designed by Goen and this is designed by Trends. So we did the FPGA design flow, created a bitstream. We did the software design flow, created hex files. We merged the two to create an embedded system design and we're going to target a Goen micro SSC FPGA development board, the GW2A18 board and to do that, we plug in the uh, wall adapter, and that's to give higher voltage to the I.O. pins. And then we in install the USB cable. And the USB cable has drivers for four FTDI device that's on the board. So that converts the USB to JTAG, and JTAG talks to our device. And then our device can talk to the spy flash that's external because this is an SRAM-based device. It needs to boot up from somewhere. So through the USB cable and our driver for FTDI, we can cut, communicate to our go-in device and program the SRAM that's on the device uh, for our embedded Cortex-M1 design. Make sure the program modes are set to zero and turn on the power supply and the power supply LED will light and we're ready to program the board. To program the device with our FS file, the bitstream file, we double click on program device. What that will do is launch our programmer software. This is embedded in the GW EDA tools, but it's also available as standalone if you want to use it in a lab environment or your uh, production um, environment. We've got uh, the FTDI driver recognizing that there's a GW2A18 on the board and the FS file is automatically pointed to by the programmer software. The next thing to do is to click enable uh, program configure and we do that by pushing on the start button and the uh, start button will show that we are programming the SRAM, that's the operation that's defaulted and it took less than seven seconds to put the going M1 processor, our PLL settings, and any user application that you might have on there, all the peripherals, into the SRAM of the device, and the code will start running right away. And the code that's in our LED project is to enable the LEDs to sequence from left to right. So that should happen right away. One indicator on the board is that it was programmed correctly. The done bit went high. We got the done LED. So in SRAM, uh, the LED drivers are, are running through the GPIO ports that we created. And if it's not running um, in, in any design, I would recommend you, you look at your uh, FPGA flow, make sure everything was uh, done correctly and properly, and then look at your software flow. Same thing, make sure it's uh, done correctly and properly. And if those two things look okay, then maybe we can start with debugging the software. And that's where the U-Link 2 in-circuit emulator comes in. Through the USB port connected to your computer, you can talk to the header, which can be plugged into the, the board. And it, because it has memory on in, in the uh, cable, we can do some trace events. So we can trigger if an event occurs and monitor a bus and record that data or record some signals. And the way we do that is to plug in the header onto our eval board, and that's for the JTAG interface as well as the, soft, the serial wire interface. Uh, and then you just make sure it's plugged in correctly. We have a little uh, connector pin there that shows uh, which way to, to connect the, the header to the board. Then you can run your, in your Kyle tool the uh, debugger and the debugger will allow you to see the disassembled code and the main uh, C code. And then it'll show where we stopped 
in our system. So in system init is where we had a breakpoint. And then we can also set up trigger events if we want to record in the trace memory. So this is a great debug tool that can be used. Uh, because this is using a separate JTAG pins on the uh, GW218, we can also have our go in analyzer oscilloscope to debug the uh, device in the uh, using the JTAG port. Um, so we can do simultaneous uh, FPGA debug and software debug using our go in programmer cable and our U-Link cable. And so once we've verified that it works in our development board, we're ready to transfer it to your end product and we can do the same process, um, retargeting for uh, your product and then make sure that it works both in software and in hardware. And most likely it will work. So I want to thank you for your time. The FPGA and Cortex-M1 software debugged on your board um, is with a lot of help from Go In and Arm. We're here to help you differentiate your product, uh, bring up your boards, reduce your costs, and shorten your development time. And we can do this in a fast, easy, simple, and instant integration by integrating the Cortex M1 onto a Go In Micro SOC FPGA and use them in your designs. So please tell your friends about our webinars and about our Go In free uh, software and uh, tools, and we appreciate your time. Great. Thank you very much, Dave, for the presentation. At this time, I'd like to open it up for questions. Please feel free to send us your questions, and we'll respond here. If we run out of time, we'll respond to you by email. So I do have two questions. First one is, uh, can you repeat where to get development kits in the U.S.? And so I can answer that one for you. Uh, we do have uh, development kits available at our distributor. Our U.S. distributor is Edge Electronics, and they can be found at edgeelectronics.com. Uh, they list all of our products there and um, can be purchased online. For other geos in the world, um, you can go to our website at goinsemi.com, and uh, if you go to the contact page, you'll be able to find all of our other distributors located uh, in all the different geos that we have. Uh, second question is, is there a fee or cost for the software tools? Uh, Dave, you want to answer that? Uh, definitely. Uh, there is no cost. That's why uh, this is such a popular program, the Design Start FPGA program. Uh, you've got the free GWEDA tools from GoIn. Uh, you've got the uh, GNU MCU-based Eclipse uh, free software available off the developer.arm uh, site. So those development tools are free. Um, please use them with no royalty or, or no, no license um, fees. And uh, we're here to help you uh, implement that to reduce your cost. Okay, thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, we have one more question, and it is the question is, how is the programming cycle different for the Flash-based smaller FPGAs? Well, you can program the embedded Flash, so it's um, uh, what we call a quick start. So every Flash memory cell has a, a appropriate SRAM cell. So it's a single chip solution. You don't need an external spy flash. It takes a little bit longer to, to program the flash than the SRAM. So we took, what, seven seconds to uh, to configure the SRAM. It'd take a little bit longer to program the flash, but it's not that much longer. And then once you cycle power, it'll be pretty much within milliseconds. It'll copy from the um, flash to the SRAM. But it's a nice secure device. You can set the security bit on that too, so no one can read out what's inside that flash device. Okay. Here's your question. Um, we have another question here, um, and the question is: What is the power consumption difference between your FPGA and microcontroller? Oh, wait a minute. 
sorry, I just lost the question here. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, what is the power consumption difference between your FPGA and microcontroller with comparable capability? Well, everybody has different um, uh, dynamic and uh, quiescent um, power ratings, but ours is lower and simply because it's a, a smaller uh, geometry and, and we're, we're doing a lot of the things in uh, the lookup tables. So it would be, uh, it would be more like um, machine, state machines for that. And then for the controller, it would be more for uh, the, the users that have software engineers that have existing codes that they want to, uh, to uh, modify and run. So just in general, uh, this is actually complementing the uh, capabilities of your hardware team if you and software, your engineering team in general. If you've got some applications that can use the software, then we've got the M1 and M3 capability. If you've got, if you want to do it in more um, state machine type flow, you can do that in lookup tables. So it's really not a matter of power, but um, ease of uh, design. So it's kind of the, the marriage, and that's why we call them micro SOCs, because we've heard SOC in the past system on chip, but in this case, it's specifically for microcontrollers. If you start running some of the application processors, those are running all the time. So in this case, you could put the microcontroller to sleep and just run the little FPGA state machine that's running lower power, and then it could be your uh, guard and, and tell you if you need to turn on the microcontroller and do some more um, artificial intelligence or something that needs more horsepower. So it's a, it's a good um, hybrid combination. Okay. Uh, David, we got another question for you. Do we need a license to run Simplify? You do, but it's included for free with our tool. We, we pay lots of money to Synopsys for the tool and we, we uh, don't charge for our tool, but we do give you a license for Simplify. It's specifically for Goin. And when you do request a, a license, node locked or floating, uh, you will get that um, uh, that license for both Goin EDA and Synopsys Simplify Pro. Okay. Another question, uh, do I need to have license ARM tool to debug my application? How do you debug your application with Kyle? Do you want me to yeah, repeat with that? Kyle, with <laughs> Kyle, you, you do, uh, you can get the trial um, license and then use the uh, U-Link cable to connect to your uh, board to debug. But they do have a license for the Kyle and that includes the debug capability. It's embedded in the Kyle MDK. Okay. Are there any other tools um, out there available, third-party tools that uh, one can use besides Kyle and um, GNU? Yeah, there's, there's uh, other... Um, companies that have uh, um, trace capable um, cables as well as uh, software um, for uh, the Cortex series. So those can be used too. Okay. What One that comes to mind is IAR, I believe, has that capability. So um, another question is, how can we get the small PCB from ResNet in USA? Oh, the trends? Trends Micro? I, I guess so, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to answer that? Yeah, I can answer that. Yeah, so um, if you go to the Trends website, um, the small PCB board that we showed, um, you can actually, um, well, either go to our website under the D, uh, DVKs that we have there, and it'll link to the Trends website or go directly to the uh, trendselectronic.com uh, website, and you'll be able to order it from there, and they ship worldwide. Uh, last question is, um, do your EDA tools come with an HDL Verilog simulator? We don't have a simulator per se. We have a, a static timing analyzer report that you can use. Uh, we do, like I showed you in the uh, place and route configuration, the ability to create the SDF file, which can be used in model sim or uh, any kind of um, timing simulator package that's out there. Okay, uh, that looks like 
we have no more questions. Anyone else have anything? Okay. So I'd like to thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. We will be rebroadcasting live today, again at 7 p.m. Pacific time, if you missed anything here. A video will also be available starting tomorrow. You'll all be sent a link uh, so you can access the video at a later time. We will be presenting and exhibiting at ARM TechCon 2019, October 8th through 10th at the San Jose Convention Center. Please reach out to us if you have any questions. We look forward to seeing you there. If there's no more questions, then this concludes the webinar. Thank you for attending and goodbye.